I'm Dr. Mark Gannon, the director of the Low Vision Institute in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Let's talk about retinitis pigmentosa. Retinitis pigmentosa is a hereditary genetic condition that results in a change of the retinal pigment epithelium. And as a result of the condition, the pigment itself, the cells die. And in the typical format, they coagulate together and they form spindles throughout the retina. So when we look inside an eye that has RP, we see a very definitive pattern in the periphery of the retina. When RP begins, it starts in the periphery, and the, the pigments themselves coagulate together, working their way centrally. Ultimately, a patient with RP loses the rod cells, which are the cells in the periphery of the retina. The rod cells are those cells that are responsible for dim level illumination and dim level vision. So we use them at night. So in RP, the night vision or the dim dim light illuminate uh, vision is that part that is most frequently affected and first affected. As the condition progresses, we also lose total vision in those areas because there are no cells that are viable that are able to receive light and transform it. And ultimately, we end up with tunnel vision, a very tiny area of vision centrally. Sometimes the tunnel vision itself is very definitive so that we have a very tiny tunnel of, of uh, central vision that we're able to use that maintains very high levels of acuity and resolution. At other times, the borders of that area are more diffuse, so we don't have a definitive tunnel, but rather an area in the center that has a little higher resolution and areas surrounding it where the resolution is somewhat diminished but still functional. And we work with those two types of conditions in very different ways as far as low vision goes and rehabilitation. If the patient has a very tiny area of very definitive central vision, then they can't walk around. They have trouble bumping into things because there's no peripheral vision. They just have this very small area in the center. If they aim it appropriately, they can read tiny print and they can function at that level, but they have a great deal of difficulty with mobility. In those instances, we use devices that we call field expansion uh, lenses, and typically these are reverse telescopes and lenses that we call amorphic lenses which are very specifically designed reverse telescopes, telescopic devices. And when we reverse a telescope in a patient with retinitis pigmentosa, we diminish the acuity or the vision by the exact same factor as we expand their peripheral field. So if, for instance, we have a patient who was 20-20 centrally, and we put a reverse telescope in front of them, it's a 3x telescope, this would increase the field of vision, say, from 10 degrees to 30 degrees, but at the same time reduce the 2020 vision to 2060. At that level, they can still function and get around, but they don't bump into things, so mobility becomes tremendously enhanced. This particular procedure requires some level of therapeutic work and some rehabilitative function because their spatial orientation is changed. Their depth perception, for instance, is affected by making things smaller that might appear to be further away than they actually are. So it's very important that we rehabilitate these patients and coordinate the use of these reverse telescopes with their condition and, and their function. The amorphic lenses that I described are a very distinct amorphic lens. Uh, there's only one company actually manufacturing them, and that's Designs for Vision in, in Ronkonkoma, New York. And uh, these particular amorphic lenses expand the field in one direction, but not in the other. So what we essentially have is a reverse telescope that widens the field, but doesn't change the vertical component of it. And in so doing, we can increase the field, for instance, as we said, three times with a 3x amorphic lens, but we may take the vision from 2020 only down a line or two in the chart to 2025 or 2030. So we maintain a tremendous amount of visual function while expanding the field at the same time. And that's a wonderful innovation for patients who have RP who are having difficulty getting around. In the other format, we have patients with RP who again have some useful vision immediately around the macula. And those patients have, have a function that we could utilize or tap into, but the, the actual sensitivity or acuity in those areas is decreased. And the way we tap into those, again, is with magnification. So we take, take again, a smaller image and we put it out there in those areas that are a little less sensitive. But by magnifying appropriately, we're, again, able to regain some levels of sight in those particular areas. So we'll utilize the typical telescopes and telemicroscopic devices that we utilize in low vision patients to get those patients to see and read and function at a little higher level. And in RP, those are the two major things that we do to try to improve acuity and mobility. 
There's also a tremendous amount of glare sensitivity in patients with RP, and sometimes we have a little bit of nystagmus that accompanies it as well, which is kind of a vibrating movement to the eye that, again, will diminish the acuity. And by utilizing appropriate lighting and filters in those particular instances, we're able to get much better patient responses. So it's very critical that we utilize light that's appropriately balanced and also at the same time utilize filters that will make the eye as comfortable and as relaxed as possible. So what we come away with here is that patients with retinitis pigmentosa can benefit from different types of intervention that may improve their visual function. And I want to thank you and remind you that there is new hope in sight. Thank you again.